have them. And I was telling Rick a while ago, I've had Galatian stuff for years, you know. I, I was pretty organized in it. And I've taken First Thessalonians several times. That's part of the problem. And uh, <clears throat> it was uh, not as organized. My notes were not. My notebook was just, it was a mess. And so trying to get it together and putting everything together. And I just want to forewarn you, Second Thessalonians is even worse. <laughs> I keep two separate notebooks. And so uh, I'm going to try to have you some decent notes. But mine are not that great. It's a re relatively short book. So you don't, uh, you know, it's, it's not, uh, there's not a whole lot as far as, uh, you know, things to talk about or words and so forth in there that we need to look at. Well, that's just great. Curse the man who put Apple, these little things on here. Let me see if I can get this going again. Unless I'm talking to something wireless, wirelessly, I have to use a USB-C plug, which has to go into an HDMI adapter, which has to go into the projector, which is, uh, hey, well, you know I'm up there, but I ain't here. Isn't that great? Well, I don't even know how to do this, how to get it back. I mean, I'm, I don't even have anything on my screen. You know, Apple Escape is just not as good. Uh, well, I don't want to do that. Boy, on a night when we've got so much to do. <clears throat> well, if we have to restart, we'll restart. This is what I do. My apologies. Well, we can go ahead and look at the text. Therefore, because of what we talked about in chapters 1 and 2, we could no longer endure it. We thought it would be uh, best to be left behind alone at Athens. Now, if you're familiar with the Apostle Paul, that was not the way he liked to roll. He had an entourage. You know, he had a group of folks that traveled with him. And for him to, you know, give that up <clears throat> and, uh, you know, uh, be by himself, that's a big deal. And you remember all that takes place in Athens, Acts 17 is the backstory of that. And he goes in and he's constantly in the Agora, the marketplace, talking with the, uh, here we go, talking with uh, folks. And then he gets, I guess, an invitation to go to Mars Hill. If you get a chance, go to YouTube, get on uh, YouTube uh, GoPro Mars Hill Tour. And it is just absolutely, uh, I had no idea that uh, Paul was, act, you know, right there at the backdrop is the, uh, you know, the, the big temple, Zeus's temple there in Athens. And it's just, you're like, wow, here he is talking about Zeus and all these guys and how they're not gods and how he talks about the one God of heaven. Uh, <clears throat> just absolutely amazing. <clears throat> and that's the backdrop. <clears throat> and so you can see he sent Timothy, our brother and God's fellow worker, in the gospel of Christ to strengthen and encourage you for the benefit of your faith so that no one would be disturbed by these afflictions. And so uh, what's he saying here? And I'm reading from the NASB. Pardon me. That's probably why you're having a hard time figuring out where I am. That no man should be moved by these afflictions. For you yourselves know that we are appointed thereunto. And he's talking about the uh, problems that they're going through. And uh, <clears throat> the afflictions they're going through. <clears throat> we can only speculate on what those are, what those are. but I know uh, one in particular that he addresses is this whole idea of the second coming. It is not a problem that we still don't have today. You know, you've got in the denominational world, you've got the uh, premillennial idea that is uh, one of the uh, things that we combat, even in our own brotherhood. You've got uh, folks that are uh, teaching uh, what we used to refer to as kingism. I'm not sure that uh, what they call it nowadays. Uh, <clears throat> and then we even have brethren, you know, talking about a reconstituted earth and so forth. And so, uh, boy, this has taken a long time. And so we still have problems with eschatology. And so Paul writes this first letter. The every chapter ends with Jesus is coming, and he's going to address that again. Uh, in, a, in a greater fashion um, with the second letter to try to clear up some things that they didn't get. <sighs> you know, if these things weren't so, so expensive, I would just take it and throw it out in the parking lot and just watch it. 
I'm verifying stuff that I don't want to verify, nor do I care. Cursed be Microsoft. Hey, how many times is, do you suppose my messages are going to open up? Well, how are y'all doing? It's a great day, isn't it? It's been uh, yeah, 9 o'clock at night. you got a preacher that doesn't know how to... Here we go. Let's try it again. Nope. I just want to cry. Y'all mind if I cry? Is it all right for grown men to cry? I'm not. Y'all don't see anything, do you? Okay. My bad, Peter. I unplugged it. How dare me? Yeah, this is so secure, you know. No, it's not. It's just we've got, really, we're trying to go through three chapters tonight. Okay. Paul was concerned with the church everywhere. Remember, he had talked about his prayers and so forth. Concerned about those in Thessalonica, and he'll talk about their faith in verses 2, 5, 6, 7, and 10. He knew they faced afflictions, adversaries, and anguish. The, uh, you know, uh, acrostics, they're pretty cool if you want to use those, especially if you're trying to lay out a lesson, kind of help you uh, divide it up, you know. He will make sure that they are not moved, verse 3. They stand fast. They might be established, verse 13. The great thing about this is it's on, uh, you can go back and watch it later, right? Uh, 13 verses. Here's how we'd like to break it down. The believer stability. All of these outlines that I'm giving you on the PowerPoint are from the, uh, a fellow by the name of, uh, well, it'll come to me in a little while. I want to make sure I give him credit because these are his uh, these are his outlines, and so that's how we're going to break this chapter down. It comes from instruction of the Word, from the association of people, prayers of the saints, and the right relationship with the children of God, and finally the anticipation of the coming of the Son of God. Let's begin with the Word of God. Couldn't forbear, couldn't stay in it any longer. He sends Timothy to establish them. That means to set fast, to you know build them up, to stand stiff, and then pay attention. Chapter three. This, this is going to come up over and over again, this perikaleo, this comfort. And brethren, I tell you what, here you got a church doing good. They love each other. And Paul keeps stressing this perikaleo, this you call to the side to walk with each other, to encourage each other, to exhort each other. I think a lot of times we don't really appreciate, I know I don't, appreciate how important we are to each other. Uh, and we spend so little time together. Uh, you know, most congregations I've ever been associated with, we'll have a fellowship meal maybe once a month. Uh, you know, sometimes uh, we'll uh, have a singing on a certain night and uh, maybe some finger foods or something afterwards. But most of the time, you've got about a 10-minute window in the beginning of services, and you've got about a 15 to 30-minute window after services for those who will hang around. But that's not a lot of time to get, get to know folks. And then you start thinking about people's attendance and you realize that, you know, sometimes you have even less time with certain people. So it's important to comfort each other. He encourages them to comfort each other. And it's something that we need to do concerning your faith. How can you know about somebody's faith if you don't spend a little bit of time with them? That no man should be moved to flatter, to beguile. It's a sense only here in the New Testament. It's one of those hapax legomanon, uh, which means it's only used once. Ephesians 4 at verse 14, that you be no more children tossed to and fro. And what's part of the problem with that is you don't have the, they didn't have the revealed word. But Timothy goes back to encourage them. Remember, this is the time of uh, what we would call uh, the miraculous time. You've got folks that have certain gifts. And we'll talk about those a little bit more as we move through this uh, book. And you really get a class on that in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 through 14, those three chapters. Notice this is pressure. No man should be moved by this pressure. He'd already talked about how the Jewish church in Judah, how the Judean church had suffered from the persecution of the Jews. and says, you're going through the same thing. And you yourselves know that we are appointed thereunto. The ESV translates that, for you yourselves know that we are destined for this. This is what happens to Christians. They are persecuted for their belief. Anybody who will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. For verily, when we were with you, we told you that you should suffer. This is not something they were not expecting. We told you. We kept telling you ESV gives you the tense of the Greek verb there. 
it's not something they just did once, but they, they kept on reiterating, look, this is what's going to happen, that you should suffer tribulation. Uh, not mere prediction, but God's appointed will, as it turned out in Thessalonica. Uh, notice, yea, all that will live godly in Christ Jesus. You know, you're familiar with 2 Timothy 3.12, John 16.33. These things have I spoken unto you that in me you might have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I love that. Be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. Notice as we move on, the second part, it comes from association with the people of God. That's so important for us. For this cause, when I could no longer forbear, I sent to know your faith, lest by some means the tempter have tempted you, and we labor in vain. Your faith, he wants to know how they're doing. But now when Timotheus came from you unto us and brought us good tidings of your faith, boy, it lifted him up in your love and that you have good remembrance of us always. You haven't forgot what Paul had taught. And he says, desiring greatly to see us as we also to see you. What wonderful news that would have been. Notice uh, the, the, the NIV says, but Timothy has just now come to us from you. This is a new information, if you will. He brought us good tidings. That's the exact same word. That we get our word evangelized from. Good news. And that's the good news. The, this particular good news. Is how the Thessalonians were doing great. And loved Paul. And loved the work he was doing. Concerning their faith and their agape. Their agapa, agapao. Uh, their love. That you have good remembrance of us always. Desiring greatly. The strong desires. That's just beautiful isn't it? And that therefore brethren. We were what? Perikaleo. Isn't that a great thing when you hear about somebody that, uh, there was a man just recently passed, I mean like last week we had his funeral. He had a heavy influence on me. And during that funeral, Reggie, I realized he'd only been an active member of the Lord's Church for about seven years. The way he conducted himself and the level of knowledge he had, his singing ability, I just assumed he was born in the church. You know one of those deals, he's a, a grown man, but I figured he'd been there forever. And I was a 15-year-old man at the time. And uh, just had a tremendous influence on me. And he was one of the leaders of that congregation for a long time. Ended up moving away with his job and so forth. And then later on I found out that he wasn't faithful. That he had quit going to church. Him and his wife both. And I was like, well man, I'm going to tie a knot in him next time I see him. And sure enough, I did. I caught him at a funeral. That's the only time we see each other, you know, a family anymore. Is somebody who has to pass away for us to have a reunion. But anyway. I saw him, I said, what is this I hear about you not being faithful? And I just told him, I said, listen, man, I wouldn't even be doing what I'm doing if it wasn't for you. And here you are, you won't even bother going to church? I said, come on, you're better than that. Lo and behold, next thing I hear, right back in church, being faithful as always. And boy, that just, uh, that pericaleoed me, if you will. That was a great comfort to me. Uh, and maybe just, you know, sometimes maybe that's what we need to do with other folks. Look, man, you you make an impression on me. Uh, I'm thankful for you. And I need, I need you back. And notice this thalipsis idea is pressure. There's, there's affliction they're going through. And it's, uh, it's, it's not good. It's not something we enjoy. Uh, but we're to go through it with joy. And not joy that we're being afflicted. But because we are Christians and the cause that we're going through it. So now we live, it says, if you stand fast in the Lord. Stay go to stand firm. You're... Being what you ought to be, so it made Paul realize that he had prepared them well enough, anyway, to uh, face what they're going through. To really re re live in rejoicing and not just be trudging on. Colossians 3, verses 1 through 3, seek those things which are above where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Don't think about the world, seek those things that are above. Now, third part, it comes by prayer of the saints to God. Let's focus, notice verse 9. For what thanks can we render to God again for you, for all the joy wherewith we joy for your sakes before our God? Thankfulness. Brethren, we, we need to be a thankful people. If we are thankful, it will help keep us in line, if you will. And I'm talking about, uh, and we'll, it's in your notes, and hopefully we'll, we'll go over this again, but you need to be thankful about the mundane things, not the exciting things. I mean, it's great to be exciting, uh, you know, have some excitement in your life, I don't know about your life, but I would say most people would think my life's boring. And I think that my life's very stressful. <laughs> you know, so I'm glad it's boring. I can't imagine what it'd be if it was always something cooking. I don't like drama. I'm kind of, a, you know, a person that doesn't like a lot of excitement. My idea of excitement is hollering at the TV when, uh, you know, the Falcons are getting creamed. But anyway, 
Uh, you know, but be thankful. Be thankful for the mundane things because that's what make up your life. And if you're thankful for the, the every day, your air, your sunshine, the rain, the food that we have, the job that we have, the ability to provide for our families, then when you hit those exciting times, and for, I'm afraid, a lot of times those exciting times have to deal with funeral homes and hospitals and things like that. You're not uh, trying to brush up on how to do all that because you've been praying all along and you're pretty comfortable with it. And so we need to have prayer lives and we need to be thankful. And we need to be thankful for our health now. Well, we got so many people on our prayer list right now. It's absolutely amazing. And I mean, people going through it, having these kind of surgeries and cancers. And, and here I am and I'm just like, boy, I know my time's coming. You know what I'm saying? It's just you're wondering <laughs> when's the other shoe going to drop, you know? Uh, but I'm, I'm aware of that and I, you know, boy, if you're able to get around and uh, be thankful for that, be thankful for that and be appreciative to God for the, you know, the health that we have and maybe your health ain't all that great, but um, probably better than somebody else's, you know, so, you know, we need to be a thankful folks. Everything we do, we give thanks. Greek literally states, what thanks can we pay back to God? Paul realizes that what's going on there is a blessing from God in Thessalonica. And he's like, how in the world can I show my appreciation to God for that? He says, we pray most earnestly night and day that we may see you face to face and supply what is lacking in your faith through education, through the word. And also remember that Paul could, with his hands, give people miraculous ability in, in that day and age. So what is lacking in your faith? Also just to see you. Um, and there's that big old long word if you can say it great but it means it's like superfluity you know that's I love that verse the superfluity of naughtiness I mean it just sounds cool and then you go ooh, that means bad but anyway so just running over just running over that's the idea there we pray most earnestly running over night and day that we may see you again uh, notice your faith and here are the last uh, the last section or next to the last section it comes from the right relationship with the children of God. Now, God himself and our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ direct our way unto you, remembering who's in charge and who's putting it all together, if you will. Direct is to the idea to make straight, guide, direct, to remove hindrances. The idea is what you find with uh, the one crying in the wilderness. The idea there, make way for the Lord. Isaiah chapter 40, verses 1 through 3 of John the Baptist Every time, uh, first time I ever read that, it's a military term, talking about preparing the way for the king, cutting down trees, making things flat. And I always think of combat engineers because uh, you're talking about a stinky job. Uh, I remember looking through my scope on the M1 tank I was on, and I was telling my tank commander, I said, there's a bunch of dudes down there. I said, man, they're cutting that Constantina wire and they're moving all that. I said, they're out in front of the infantry. I said, who are those people? He says, that's the engineers. I said, man, they got to be crazy. He said, yep. <laughs> you know, uh, they're out there in harm's way, getting everything ready so the infantry can come through and the tanks, we're giving the, you know, the heavy stuff. Uh, I was just like, man. And so every time I think of that military term of those guys going ahead, making straight the paths, think of John the Baptist, I think of those engineers and the job that they're doing to uh, get across those enemy defenses and stuff. I mean, even in attack mode, they're the ones putting bridges over the ditches and putting bridges over the water. Amazing. Uh, that's the idea. May God direct our way to you, prepare a way in which we can get to you. Uh, notice verse, uh, let's see, verse 12. And the Lord make you to increase and abound in love one toward another. And notice what he says about that. And toward all, all men, okay, I want you to keep going. I want it to abound. Ooh, here we go even as we do towards you, they're already doing a, a great thing. Notice verse 13. To the end, the, uh, that uh, the, it comes from the anticipation of the coming of the Son of God. And here we are, another end of a chapter in the first Thessalonian letter. And what's he talking about? Jesus is coming. To the end, that he may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before God, even our Father, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. I want you to notice this word coming. It's from Perugia. You'll see that a lot. We don't use that word a whole lot, but the denominational world loves it. Uh, since, uh, you know, if you want to get people excited, I put that in your notes, but there's about three things that you can talk about that get folks excited. 
Uh, one is the second coming of Christ, whatever their aspect of that is. The second one is what the Holy Spirit has told them today, and I don't mean that through their Bibles. I'm talking about they get excited about that. And boy, and I tell you what, it's hard to convince somebody that when you're trying to study with them and they think God's talking to them, that, uh, you know, you're about anything, really. Uh, and then contemporary worship. You know, you get the lights down low, you get the, the strobes going, the beats going, the guitars playing, the... Uh, you've got so many emotional swings and stuff that you can use with all the theatrics of, of Hollywood. And, I mean, showmanship, that's just, uh, you can use that to, drunk, to you know, move people into a frenzy. There's no, if you ever watch any of those programs, I, I used to, I haven't in years, but I wasn't uh, blind to the fact that they would use lighting, they would use uh you know, here the preacher's getting it and the band's are getting it and then all of a sudden when it comes time to, you know, for the Holy Spirit to move and people to be convicted, all of a sudden the lights get dim and there's just a lone saxophone or something playing in the background and that's all just a ding, 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 pulling on uh, heart strings. And, you know, Paul would say, man, we're not about that. Second Corinthians chapter 4, we're, we're out here telling you the truth. We don't beguile you. We're not trying to sneak you in. We want to convince your mind, uh, and, and that's what gospel preaching is, is, is really all about. And so there's the believer's stability that Jesus is coming. Well, let's go ahead and jump into chapter 4, talk about the believer's walk. Paul really stresses the principle of sanctification in verses 3, 4, and 7. Walk, peripateo, it's the idea of just to uh, stomp around, if you will. That's the, and it means not really walking so much in the New Testament as manner of life, how you live. One's manner of life is important to the view of the fact that, what? Jesus is coming. That's the bottom line. You need, to be, you need to be what God would have you to be. And we're not at liberty to walk in any way we see fit. When we talk about the Christian walk, that uh, immediately implies that there's a walk that is not Christian. And that's where most people are walking today. We're going to divide this uh, first part into three sections. Uh, walk will be in holiness. It will be in harmony. And it will be in honesty. And then we will switch gears at verse 13 because Paul switches gears there, okay? It will be a walk in holiness. Furthermore, it's adding on to what we've already said. Then we beseech you, brethren, that you, and exhort you by the Lord Jesus Christ, as ye have received us, how ye ought to walk and please God, so you would abound more and more. Here we are. Love each other more, make it abound. Superfluid, you know, like we said a while ago. Just overflow. You cannot have enough love for the brethren because brethren are going to do everything they can to try that love <laughs> and so it's important that you have a relationship uh, you know eldership have got to love the flock they have got to look at them as their ch at folks as their children because uh unfortunately you know uh people make mistakes sometimes they need to be instructed correctly and that's why I'm absolutely convinced uh, that, in, like I know something God doesn't know, but why men have to have a family. Because you go through that with your children, and they make mistakes, and you have to try to correct them, and you have to try to bring them back home, if you will, in some cases. And so uh, we have a tendency to be long-suffering with them, and I think that helps us as we start dealing with uh, uh, our, you know, the congregation. Furthermore, finally, as for the rest, closing up the book, if you will, starting to shut it down anyway, Adelphos. This is something that appears over and over and over in the book of Thessalonians, the idea of brethren, the idea of comfort, the idea of uh, loving each other. And here's that peripateo. Peri, the, uh, it's a preposition, means around, and pateo means to trample, to walk around. But with uh, most of the time, you're going to find the walk in the New Testament is talking about how you live. And to please God, God's will or God's wrath, which one do you want to do? You know, that's not much. And there's a parathetical statement. Uh, it's not in the King James, but it's in the Sinaiticus, the Alegranius, and the Vaticanus. And the reason that's significant is that is your three heavy hitters uh, in the Codex. Uh, they, they are books, partial books now. Uh, they are not uh, Matthew through Revelation. But they carry a lot of weight. And so if you have a Greek New Testament with all those cool little footnotes at the bottom, uh, each one of these has their own little uh, signature or their number. And uh, when these three are saying something, a lot of people stop and listen up. Uh, the sign Atticus has never really made me real happy. It was found real late. A guy went over to Germany, you know, into Europe 
uh, to find the oldest manuscript, and lo and behold, wow, he found it. Well, you know, I mean, 1,850 years after the fact, 1,750. I'm like, hmm, I don't know about that. And you'll always see they appeal to it uh, because it's supposed to be the oldest. And, um, well, anyway. Anyway, those three guys, there, there's a parenthetical statement there and says, even as you do walk. He says, as you walk to please God, even so as you do walk, the American Standard Version uh, leans heavily on the Sinaiticus, uh, you know, the, and so you're going to find that there. Most of your newer translations will run with that as well. Okay, just as you are doing is how the ESV gives that parenthetical statement. It says, for you know, you're aware what commandments we gave you by the Lord. Isn't that amazing? Uh, commandments, yes. A lot of folks want to tell you we're not under law today, that, you know, uh, you people over there, all you're in do is commandment keeping. Well, you know, commandments are pretty important. You know, if you love me, you know, uh, Jesus said, uh, keep my commandments. Now, who would want to throw those out? That's a, uh, and the idea there, of course, is military term, just used in orders. This is something that you need to do. It says, for this is the will of God, the lemma, a determination. This is something that God would have you to do. Even your sanctification, that's just a fancy word for saint, hagios, holy, properly, purification, if you will, that you should abstain from fornication. Isn't it amazing that every time you start talking about sin, that's one of the first ones that popped up, isn't it? And why do you think that is? I think it's got something to do with the garden, don't you? God made a man, and a male and female. And we've been the same way ever since. Now, I know some people are having a hard time with that nowadays. You know, uh, it's amazing to me. I don't know why they don't walk on their hands and clap with their feet now. If that's if they're that mixed up, you might as well go ahead and just invert the whole thing, you know. But anyway, they're having problems with that. But man is, since the garden, has been a sexual being. He's also, pretty much not too long after that, had trouble controlling that desire. <laughs> you know, I ain't much of a, a fan of uh, Buddha or Gandhi. But I remember, uh, I can't remember which one of them it was now, but he said uh, if there had been one more uh, urge as strong as food and uh, the sexual urge, he wouldn't have been able to reach nirvana. So it must have been Buddha. Isn't that who goes to nirvana? And I'm going like, <laughs> yeah. I had a guy one time came to me, confessed that he had been adulterous, that he was the guilty party. His wife was cool. She was great and everything. Of course, he changed his story a few weeks later. Came front that front that morning, you know, confessed his sins. Uh, and then he said something to me later that Reggie has always stuck with me because I, 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 I tried to keep a straight face and just not, like, laugh at him. But he said, women. He said, that's always been my problem. You know, I'm just, he said, I'm just crazy about women. And I'm going, like, there's a reason behind that. And let me tell you something, dude. You're not the only one going through that. You know, you've got to learn to harness that. You know, uh, young guys like young ladies, and young ladies like, you like young guys. And if you don't teach children how to handle that and what the proper relationship is, you're going to have modern-day America. And that's the last thing you want is a bunch of people who don't know who daddy is and who mama is and families that are just totally dysfunctional. Because uh, the folks aren't there to do the child raising. Because they're too busy enjoying each other's fornication. And it's enough to make angels weep. Well, abstain from fornication. Uh, you cannot have a stable society. You cannot have a stable family. Uh, life, you, the very foundation of, uh, you know, and that's one of the frustrating things. And I, boy, the last thing I need to do tonight is take off on a tangent. But if the government can't figure out that it's a man and a woman in the house, then you, your foundation stinks from the beginning, and it ain't going to get any better until we can improve uh, the understanding of the home in this country. Uh, well, we're just going to have problems. Abstain from fornication. Pornea covers all of it. Okay, uh, remember one time there was a lady up where a friend of mine was preaching. He was preaching Matthew 19, 9. He says, And I say unto you, whosoever shall... Uh, committed, you know, and I say unto you, whosoever shall put away his wife, except for the cause of fornication, and marrieth another, doth commit adultery. And she said, you see right there, that's not even possible to do today. She says, because fornication is something that unmarried people do, 
And here you got a guy who's married, so he can't commit fornication. And I'm going like, boy, I tell you what, that's a sad ex of Jesus. <laughs> Sorry, Jesus, but you just missed it on that. No, <laughs> the idea of <laughs> the idea of uh, fornication is from this word you see up here, pornea. We get our word pornography and so forth. And it covers it all, folks. It's a one-stop shop. Whatever kind of sexual perversion you can think of, it fits right there, okay? It is pornea. It, it would be it, we ain't going to talk about it. It's just, if it ain't a husband and a wife, and it's in the sexual realm, it's pornea, okay? Need to stay away from it. All wrong sexual relations. Notice that every one of you should know how to possess this vessel. There are some who uh, believe this vessel is a wife, is the man's wife. A wife is never called a, a man's vessel in all of the New Testament. However, his body is often referred to. And I think the context just brings this out. But one of my Bible class teachers years ago who had a tremendous amount of respect for him, uh, you know, thought that this was talking about the man's wife. And I'm just like, uh, you know, I just didn't agree with that and still don't agree with that. I think the context is talking about people. You know, a female needs to be able to uh, do this as well. Uh, Earl Edwards in his commentary on this says it is significant to observe that a man's wife is never spoken of elsewhere in the Bible as his vessel whereas the human body is elsewhere called your vessel or instrument and there's some uh, verses for you and I guarantee you that is not in Romans 90. Uh, I don't know a lot but I know it's not in Romans 90 so I'm going to go with Romans 9 on that one. Uh, notice when interpreted, this is uh, as such, the verse becomes a parallel to Romans six nineteen. Now present your members, your body, as slaves to righteousness leading to sanctification. So that's my thoughts. And if you think it's his wife, well, you have fun. But I just think it, uh, in the context, not in the lust. Pathos is the word there. Whatever befalls one, whether it is sad or joyous, and this concupiscence is a longing especially for what is forbidden. It's, uh, as far as I know, in the New Testament, is always used in the negative, negative sense. It means a strong desire, and generally for that which is not allowed by God. So not in the lust of concupiscence, even as the Gentiles which know not God. Uh, Luke twenty-two fifteen, he said unto them, with desire, I have desired to eat this Passover. See, sometimes it can be used in a positive sense, but here, of course, it's definitely in the uh, negative sense. Gentiles here is just a word ethnos. Well, we get our word ethnic. It's just a race other than the Jews. It, everybody was either a Jew or a Gentile. That's just how they, uh, they did it, uh, talked about it, and it's not a bad thing. Sometimes Gentiles, if you, they wanted to be specific, they might call them barbarians or uh, uh, Hellenists, which would limit it you know, to, to the Greeks. Romans chapter 1, we're not going to read this. It's, you know, you're familiar with it. It talks about all how messed up the Gentile world was and how uh, uh, they had the opportunity. They knew who God was, but they decided not to worship him as God and so forth. Professing themselves to become wise, uh, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. That is where we are, uh, I think, in the scientific community and in all the education in our country. Uh, this is where I think most folks are today. Here it talks about worshiping idols and gave, in them, gave themselves up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies. We see that today so much. Verse 6, That no man go beyond and defraud his brother in any manner, because that the Lord is an avenger of all such, as we also have forewarned you and testified. When I teach, especially young people, fornication, you know, teenage classes about sexual purity and stuff, this is one of the things I try to bring out. You don't want to defraud your brother. You don't want it another man's daughter or be it another man's girlfriend or fiance or his wife. That's a relationship you need to stay out of because that the Lord is the avenger of all such as we have also forewarned you and testified. You need to stay away from what belongs to another man. Uh, to go beyond, uh, we said, to defraud, take away. Notice verse 7, For God hath not called us unto uncleanness, but unto holiness. He therefore that despises, despises not man, but God, who hath also given us his Holy Spirit. In other words, you're not just corrupting a, a relationship. You're not just taking something from somebody else, but you're sinning against the very God of heaven. ESV translates that, Therefore, whosoever disregards this, disregards not man, but God. 
who gives us His Holy Spirit. Notice, it will be a walk in harmony. But as touching brotherly love, you need not that I write unto you. They don't even need this. Why is that? For you yourselves are taught of God to love one another. They know this. That word Philadelphia is the word used there, brotherly love. Any of y'all ever been to Philadelphia? That's the most unloving place I've ever been. They have really messed that name up. <laughs> they ought to change that up. Okay. There we go. Boy. Oh, and just rude, man. Yeah. In the NFL, the, the old ass players, what's the worst place to play? They'll say Philadelphia. You know, you don't know if you're going to get out of there alive, man, because it's just, it's just a rough place. I, maybe it wasn't that way at one time, but Philo, uh, love, Delphos, brothers, Philadelphia, brotherly love. Taught of God, theodidactos. Uh, we think about didactic teaching. That's where that word comes from. And indeed, you do it toward all the brethren which are in all Macedonia, and we beseech you, brethren, that you increase more and more. Here we go. They're doing it. They're all over it. They're loving each other, and they're encouraging each other. And Paul says, you know what? That's great. But we want you to increase more and more. Because you ever take any business classes? I, I took some. What a waste. Uh, I, took, I, I was in industrial management, uh, trying to get an associate's degree at Chattanooga State. And I, but I do remember this one class, and I've always remembered that, that if a business is not going up, guess what's happening? Well, it's going down, or it's what? flat line which means what things are bad that's when you start going hey what's happening so you put stuff on sale and you start you know give ronald mcdonald a new costume or something so that sales can go back up because if you're not growing you're what you're dying and so uh, that's the idea there grow more and more encourage your love keep your love working hard to increase more and more uh here we go Walk in honesty, verse 11, that you study to be quiet. This is an interesting word. Uh, philo, love, time, uh, me, to, me, oh, to honor, notice, to be fond of honor. That you study to be quiet. That you labor, that you strive, eager or earnest to do something. That you study to be quiet. That, that's just an interesting concept. There's a lot of things that you might... Think about studying in or really putting forth effort. But notice this is talking about to do your own business, to work with your own hands. In other words, stay out of other people's business. Some people like to get in other people's business. I do not like to get in other people's business because I am not managing my own business very well. You know, my, my own person, the last thing I want to do is jump in the middle of somebody else's. Sometimes as a preacher... You're asked to counsel and so forth. And I, and I try to tell people, I don't have a shield on my wall. I am not a counselor. But I can tell you what the Bible says. And I will tell you how, you know, I interpret how God feels about the situation that you're going through. So in that way, we can give the wisest counsel. I took a counseling class one time. It was a weekend deal. It was put on by Fried Hardeman. He had to go two solid days, you know. And so I went up there and they had two different guys preaching it. You had the person that was over the uh, the whole whatever those people are you go sit on the couch and talk to him what do you call it psychologist the whole he was over it all you know phd 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 whatever then they had uh, jesse robertson who was a preacher gospel preacher and he was over this guy because he was over the whole uh whatever field or wing that's in you know and i tell you what it was like listening to dr jekyll and mr hyde it was yin and yang it was day and night. One guy, the, the guy who was a professional, said the one thing that you would never do is ever introduce God into a therapy session. Unless that, yeah, I know, I was, I was going like, I want to throw my pencil at him. I was going like, that's the first person you ought to introduce into the conversation. And, of course, Jesse comes in, the gospel preacher guy, and he, uh, he's, he's using psalms to talk about counseling, and, I mean, just <laughs> nailing it, you know. This is God behind this, you know, and I mean, like, this guy's saying don't do it. He's saying do do it. I got a certificate and got my class time in, you know, so, I, you know, there I am. But uh, I immediately thought that is not the kind of, if I was a counselor, I would not want to be one that didn't bring God into the session. Uh, I just think that's where the, the mess up is, you know. I think that's how we mess up. Well, 
Let's get this idea. Well, look how this word's used. Romans 15, 20, yea, so I have strived. Same word. Word translated study, strived in Romans 15, 20. It says that you labor. Wherefore, we labor in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 9. I love word studies and probably spend way too much time on it and probably bore you with such. But I just think it's interesting how uh, a word is used and in the context it has a, a different meaning than it does in another place. And that's why we've got to be careful uh, when we say, uh, you know, this always means this or this always means that. No study to be quiet. Now, I don't know if a lot of brethren read Robertson's word pictures or what, but a lot of folks that I read commentaries on and people talking about uh, went on and on about this restless spirit in Thessalonica and that Greeks in general had a restless spirit. I, I don't know what preempts that or how they really know that. I know, like the Phoenicians, I know they, had a, they were kind of on the go, but that's what they did, right? They were merchants, and so they were always going everywhere, and maybe it's because they lived close to the Mediterranean. I don't know. I do not know, but everybody seems to say that, so I guess uh, there must be something to it. But anyway, Acts uh, eleven eighteen. they heard these things. They held their peace. Notice, uh, did we, uh, 11, so to be quiet. Verse 12, that you may walk honestly toward them that are without, and that may, you may have lack of nothing. And those are without or without, you know, the folks in the world, not in the church. So that you may walk properly before outsiders is how the ESV translates that. And there's our walk there. Now I want to jump off into chapter 4, verse 13, and talk about the believer's sorrow. This is a pretty decent little sermon if you ever wanted to preach it. It's anticipated, it is moderated, and then it is commiserated. What do we mean by that? Verse 13, notice with me if you will. In verse 13, I haven't even got out of chapter 3 yet. Here we go. Chapter 13, but I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. And so believers sorrow here, we need to qualify that. Because the sorrow we have as Christians is far different from those who have no hope. Uh... And, and another thing, I have heard gospel preachers almost get on people for being sad that a loved one has gone on. Well, you know, I just think that's unrealistic. Uh, yes, we don't sorrow not, but notice he, he says there that you sorrow not even as others which have no hope. Now, it's over for them. As far as they're concerned, that's it. You know, Rover's dead like he's dead all over. I'll never see him again. And so you can imagine the, the grief they would have, but listen. As a member, faithful members of the Lord's church, if your spouse dies and you get up the next morning to eat breakfast and they're not there, that's ridiculous to say that you shouldn't be sad about that. You know, uh, we're human beings and uh, death is very real and we realize it is very uh, not good for those of us that are alive. Yes, they're doing great. We don't want to misrepresent them. You know, uh, they're, they're doing better than they ever have. They're, as far as Christians, they receive their reward. They're starting to uh, enjoy uh, in the Hadean realm and Abraham's bosom. But uh, we're here going through the daily life and, you know, we miss them. Bottom line. And that's what's happening here. Uh, these folks miss them. Miss, miss the folks that have gone on. Notice, uh, we understand the nature of man, and that helps us. As a believer, we, don't ha we know men die. That's just the nature of it. It's the nature of the body. It's going to go back to dust, and the Spirit's going to go to God who gave it. We are born, and then we pass. Then notice nextly. It is moderated. How is it moderated? Well, it's made easier by what? Knowing what it is. And what is death? Death is when the Spirit leaves the body. 2 Timothy 4, 6, Paul says, I am ready to be offered. What's he, what's he talking about? He's ready to die. Think about some of the figures of death. It's like taking down a tent. You know, if you ever go and look at somebody you've known well and they're laying in the, the coffin, you realize it's, it's really just a shell. Taking down a tent, poured out like a drink, Paul would say, a drink offering. 2 Timothy 4, verse 6, talking about going home. Second, you know, John chapter 14, verses 1 through 6, verses 1 through 3, you know, is a great text that we use so many times in, in funerals because, man, that's how that person that died, that's how that's working. 
they're, they're going where Jesus is, is preparing a place and uh, we've got a home. It's referred to as a departure. And uh, these are all, uh, we, it's made easier when we understand that. Knowing what it is, knowing what Christ did. Notice verse 14. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, Jesus did it so we know we can do it. Even so them which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. Well, bless our poor little Jehovah's Witnesses' hearts. But that doesn't t- that's not talking about soul sleeping. Uh, that is talking about folks who are dead. You don't see them. It's just like in Ecclesiastes, when the Ecclesiastes writer talks about you don't know what's anything going on. You, under the sun, you don't have an idea when you're dead. Well, it's not because you're under six foot of dirt. It's because the people in the Hadean realm don't keep up with what's happening on earth. They can't. Uh, and can you imagine what a heartache and a headache that would be if you could? Uh, they're in a place waiting for the judgment day, waiting for the return, if you will. Uh, unlike those who are in torments, Luke 16, of course, a great commentary on this. We know that Jesus rose from the dead, and so we know, too, that we are going to die. Uh, we, when we die, we're coming back. How is that? Even so them also which sleep in Jesus, what's happening here, will God bring with him. So those who are in the Hadean realm are going to come back when Christ comes back and do what? Well, they're going to get their body. Uh, general, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, the general resurrection. The, those of us that are still here will be changed in the twinkling of an eye. Uh, and others will come back. They'll be re- united with their bodies. And don't, wouldn't you like to know more about that body? Boy, I would. But uh, guess what I can tell you about it? <sighs> Very little. I can tell you, Jesus' body did some pretty neat stuff after he came back, just appearing and reappearing, and people walking with him, not even knowing who he was, and then knowing who he was, and appear and disappear, go through walls. I just That's pretty neat. Um, but anyway, notice number uh, C there, knowing what the word of the Lord says. For this is to say, for this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them or the better word there would be proceed. And don't be too hard on the King James. 400 years ago, prevent meant proceed, but it don't now. And so, thanks be unto God, we have concordances and dictionaries, and we can understand that. Nothing we do is going to prevent the Lord from doing anything, but we're not going to get in front of them. Uh, notice nextly what Christ will do, verse 16. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Put this in your notes. This is the loudest verse in the Bible as far as I know, but it is the sugar stick for premillennialists because this is their covert rapture, and this is where they'll come to try to prove that. Isn't that amazing? All that noise going on, they're going to say, well, you, you can't hear it because you're uh, not part of the elect, if you, if you will. Verse 17, what we can expect. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. And notice, knowing that we have help, verse 18, which means the the commiserated, to have sympathy with, to comfort one another. We can't think of the word comfort. This book, I didn't realize how much Pericaleo is in this book, the idea of comforting. But... um, You know, 2 Corinthians chapter, uh, what is it, 1, verses 3 and 4. You know, blessed be the God of all comfort who comforted us so that we can comfort other folks. Uh, What a great blessing that is. Expect, well, what can we expect? Well, a resurrection, and at that resurrection, a reunion. Can you imagine? I can think back, and and we'll, we'll get that here in just a minute. Help and bereavement, how is that? With faith, friends, father, and facts. Our faith. Keeps us strong. Our friends encourage us. Our Father in heaven is always with us in the facts of the Bible that we know this is going to take place. This is a sermon for you. Five things worth fighting for. Our helpers. Those in the kingdom. The word of brethren. Adelphos appears over and over in this book. That is a reason to keep fighting. When your loved one passes away or you're sad about the death of someone, we've still got a job to do and we need to keep doing it. Our heroes. When I think of my heroes in the gospel, I think of so many. But one in particular is a fellow by the name of James McGill. I, he was just everything that I always wished I could be in a Christian. But he was just, he was great. His temperament, 
One of the favorite pitchers I have is myself and Jim Lewis and James McGill. Uh, I think that was at Union Grove, wasn't it, Jim? When we go there? I think it was. And uh, you can tell how impressed Jim was with that photo. But anyway, uh, it's just, uh, he's one of my, you know, those who've gone on, those who we walk in the footsteps of. We think of the pioneer preachers. We might think of people that baptized you when you were growing up, men that you looked up to. But they're worth continuing the fight. Our hope is worth fighting for. Not as others who have no hope, but we have the hope of heaven and our honor. Think about the situation we find ourselves when we sit around the Lord's table on Sunday morning and we take of that. What an honor that is. The God of heaven and we are dining, if you will, in, in, a, in a metaphorical sense, with the Son of God as we remember His death, His burial, His resurrection. And we can do that and it's amazing that the rest of the world doesn't even want to do that. Even the folks who are religious say, well, we're going to do it in Easter. You know, we're going to do it this Sunday. Get off of us, you know. We'll do it again at Christmas. Hang around. Uh, that's amazing, isn't it? The first century church did it every... It's an honor to be able to do so. And our honor is worth fighting. Not that we're proud that we have some pride like the Pharisees or something, but that it's an honor to be in the presence of God. And then last but not least, our homes. The home in heaven, man, that's worth fighting for. It's eternal. It, nobody's going to move that landmark. I've got five minutes to get through chapter 5, but this ought to be great. Uh, here we go. Daylight disciples. That's the idea. And it's just like Paul does so much with contrast. Daylight darkness. Soberness, drunkenness. You're going to see that over and over and again in these first, uh, first few verses. Notice, but of the times and the seasons, that's a popular idiom, and it just means, uh, you know, th this particular, what's happening now. He says, you have no need that I write unto you. For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. What is he saying? You know perfectly that you don't know when the Lord's coming back. Perfect knowledge. You understand that Jesus says, neither I nor the angels of heaven have any idea when this is taking place. And yet, time and time again, you've got folks who want to base careers off trying to guess when the Lord's going to return. What does Jesus say? Matthew 24, 37, In the days of Noah, so shall be the coming of the Son of Man. People are going to be eating and drinking and doing the things they do every day. They're going to be giving their daughters in marriage. That's one thing that we can know for sure, is that marriage, believe it or not, is still going to be around when the Lord comes back because it's going to be going on. Uh, you know, uh, the idea of the thief. The virgins, you know, we think about those parables. We are daylight disciples. For when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail with a woman, with a, upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. I've already told you all how I feel about being around pregnant ladies. Uh, and I always say that wrong. Pregnant is how I'm supposed to say it. My wife corrects me every single time. Uh, you know, it's just, it's scary. <laughs> Uh, you can catch the next elevator. I tell you what, I'll get off. You can go by yourself because I don't want to be in there if something goes south, you know. Because what happens here, you've got a lady, she's, and, you know, everything's great, and I'll say, uh-oh, and everybody's like, whoa, you know, and that's the, uh, do what? Well, if it takes an, uh, five hours, that's too fast for me. I want to be, I want to be gone. But, but the idea is, you know, you know this lady's pregnant. Did I say it right? I think that was pregnant, right? I got it. Yeah, it's me. And would you tell my wife, if you see her again, that you know it's going to happen. Now, you might not know the exact time, date, hour, but you know it's going to happen. So as a pregnant woman's husband, you've got to be prepared for that. Anytime, have the car warmed up, just leave it running in the garage, right? I mean, you've got to be ready to go. Think about the analogy Paul's using here as we as Christians. We got to be ready to go. We don't know when this is going to come, so we have got to be prepared. There's no escape out of this. But ye brethren are not in darkness. Here's the idea: you're children of light. You're not in darkness. You're not drunk. You know you're sober. Uh, brethren are not taken in darkness that we should be overtaken as you as a thief, because you know better. You're all children of light, and the, not, and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. People in sin have a darkened understanding. Ephesians 4.18, having their understanding dark and being alienated from the life of God. They are just so mixed up, they can't even figure out what gender they are. And so, the effects of sin, let's get through this. We don't really have time to, uh, let's get back to the text. 
uh, talking about daylight disciples. Uh, Therefore, let us not sleep as do others. Let us watch and be sober. That's how we live life. For they that are asleep, sleep in the night, and they that are drunken are drunken in the night. That's common understanding. And notice the contrast. Children of light, children of darkness uh, is is what he's stressing here. But let us who are of the day be sober. Now that word sober would inherently involve the idea of being free from intoxicants because that's what that, this word uh, sober means, free from intoxicants. But the way it's being used here, uh, it's part of it. Sober is sober-mindedness, patient, uh, uh, temperate. Uh, yes, not drinking for sure, but also being what you ought to be, being sober-minded, being prepared, if you will. Putting on the breastplate of faith and love and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. And so there we have another picture of the Christian army. We have, armor we have in Ephesians 6. Let's keep through here. Uh, sorry. Okay, verse 9. For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by the Lord Jesus Christ. And I've got like 60 seconds, right? Salvation is not accidental. It's not hit or miss. Notice he died for us. Whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. So your status, whether you're in the paradise or you're here on earth being faithful, you're going to live together with Jesus. Christ died for us. Notice he's our intercessor, our high priest, according to that. He's our advocate, 1 John 5. We're going to stop right here because I, I've just got a great feeling about maybe me not unplugging the computer next week and maybe we can get started and I won't lose those 10 minutes and we'll get through this and the second Thessalonian letter, letter. I believe we can do it. Uh, I, think, I, think, I think we can do it. Yeah. Man, would you, I, I really need you to have a conversation with my wife because uh, you have a lot more. Uh, cur- <laughs> well, that, that may be it. That might be it. All right, here you go, Carla. 152. 152. I wonder what the chances of me remembering that are. I'd say poor, wouldn't you? <laughs> Brother and I have enjoyed it. Yes, sir, I know we're 